Hi everyone, welcome back to High School Science 101. Today I'm going to show you one of the most fundamental things that we teach in chemistry, which is how to draw an atom. Let's get started. Before we begin, it's really important to note that the model that we use to represent the atom has undergone several evolutions throughout the last 200 years. Different models proposed early on included the plum pudding model and the nuclear model. As scientists performed more experiments to try and understand atoms and what they're made of, so too did the model change throughout history. And what we use today is basically a derivative of Niels Bohr's model with some modifications made by some other scientists along the way, such as Schrodinger and Chadwick. According to our current understanding of atoms, atoms consist of a nucleus in the center. This nucleus contains two subatomic particles, which means they're types of particles that are smaller than atoms. One of these types of particles are called neutrons. So we have neutrons in the center, and then we also have protons in the center as well. And I'm going to draw a plus inside these because protons are positively charged. Neutrons don't have a charge, they're neutral, and protons are positive. And the way I teach my students to remember that is that neutrons sounds like neutral, which has no charge, and protons start with P, and so does the word positive. So protons are positively charged. And these two types of particles form the nucleus inside the atom. Flying around the outside of our nucleus, are little tiny subatomic particles called electrons. And I'm going to draw a little negative sign next to them because electrons are negatively charged. This negative charge means that they're still attracted to the nucleus because they're attracted to these protons. These electrons are so small, they're about one 1,800th of the size of our protons and neutrons in the nucleus. So they are tiny. And when we're talking about the overall mass of the atom, we don't even really factor in the electrons. When we talk about the mass of the atom, we're only referring to the neutrons and protons in the nucleus. And that's an important thing to note, and we'll get back to that a bit later on. The number of protons that an atom has tells us which element that atom is. For example, in this case, there are three protons. That tells us that this is the third element on the periodic table, which is lithium. If I have a fourth proton here, this atom would then be the fourth element. But in this case, there are three protons, which means it's our third element, lithium. Atoms have a neutral charge. So for every three positive subatomic particles that are in the nucleus, there must be three negative particles flying around the outside. In other words, if there are three protons, there must therefore be three electrons. In this case, there's only one electron. So I need to add two more electrons in this atom in order to make it neutral. We have three negatively charged particles and three positive. So overall, this atom is now neutral. You'll notice that when I drew my electrons, I didn't just draw them randomly in the space around the nucleus, I drew them in these rings. And when Niels Bohr originally pioneered this type of model, he did propose that the electrons orbit the nucleus like planets around the sun. However, now we know that the rings are really just a representation of where we're likely to find those electrons according to their energy level. So we're likely to find these two electrons at any given time in this general vicinity around the nucleus. They're flying around randomly, but sort of confined to this cloud. And then this electron is flying around randomly, but it's sort of confined to this outer area here. So rather than thinking of the electrons as orbiting like planets in the solar system, we say that the electrons are flying around randomly, but they're confined to these specific clouds based on their energy levels. This is all well and good if we know how many protons, neutrons, and electrons are in our element that we want to draw. It makes it very straightforward. However, how do we actually find out how many protons, neutrons, and electrons are in an element. How do I know this information? Let's find out. When we look up an element on the periodic table, 
We usually get three pieces of information. The most obvious piece of information is the chemical symbol. In a lot of cases, the chemical symbol relates to the English name of the element. So in this case, it's the first letter of the English name of this element called carbon. In some other cases though, the chemical symbol comes from the Latin name of the element. A lot of periodic tables will also have two numbers, one above and one below the chemical symbol. In this case, for carbon, usually it would be a six above and then a number below along the lines of 12.011. This top number is called our atomic number. And this number tells us how many protons are in a carbon nucleus. So there are six protons inside every carbon nucleus. And it also tells us that it's the sixth element on the periodic table. This bottom number is called our mass number. And if you recall earlier, I told you that electrons are a fraction of the size of protons and neutrons to the point where they're almost insignificant in terms of mass. So this mass number is the mass of the protons and neutrons combined within a carbon atom. Now we have our atomic number and mass number, how does this information help us to draw a carbon atom? Well, these two numbers actually tell us how many protons, electrons and neutrons each carbon atom has. This atomic number tells us that it has six protons. And earlier, if you recall, atoms have to be neutral. So if there are six positive protons, there have to be six negative electrons in every carbon atom. This mass number is the protons and neutrons added together. And for simplicity's sake, we give protons and neutrons each a mass of one, and we usually round the mass number to the nearest whole number, which in this case is 12. So this 12 is our protons and neutrons added together. We already know that there are six protons, so therefore our neutrons are added to this to get 12. So if there are six protons, there must be six neutrons in every carbon nucleus. Now that we know how many protons, electrons and neutrons are in every carbon atom, let's have a go at drawing it. Okay, so we know that there are six neutrons in the nucleus of our carbon atom. And we also know from that previous information that there are six protons in the nucleus. We also know that there are six electrons flying around this nucleus. So let's draw them in. We'll start off with the first two electrons. One, two. The electrons, as I said before, fly around not in just some random way, but they're sort of locked into these clouds, or let's call them shells. So this first shell can only hold two electrons. So this first shell is full. Now we need to move on to a second shell. So we've got one, two, we've got four left, three, four, five, six. That's our six electrons. We have two in the first shell and we have four in this second shell. So our electron configuration is two, four. This second shell can hold a maximum of eight electrons and then we start filling up a third shell, which can also hold eight electrons. And then we move on to a fourth shell and so on. So the atoms get bigger by increasing the number of shells as well as the number of neutrons, protons and electrons. Let me show you another example. Silicon has 14 protons, 14 electrons and 14 neutrons. Let's start off with our 14 protons in the nucleus. So we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. And we have 14 neutrons. 
1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. This forms our silicon nucleus. Flying around the outside are our 14 electrons. So we have our first shell, which holds one, two. This is now full. So we have to now move on to a second shell and start filling that. So we draw our second shell. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. This second shell now has eight electrons. This is full. So now we have to move on to a third shell. We have 14 electrons. We already have two in the center in the first shell. That shell's full. Then we've moved on to a second shell and filled that with another eight, which gives us 10 in total. So this third shell must have one, two, three, four electrons in that third shell. So the configuration of silicon would be two electrons in the first shell, eight electrons in the second shell, and then four in the third shell. Let's finish off with one more example. Let's draw a calcium atom. Calcium has 20 protons, 20 electrons, and 20 neutrons. Let's start off by drawing the protons in the nucleus. And I'm going to purposely draw these protons really, really small and the neutrons because I want to be able to fit in all of the electron shells in this diagram. So let's start with our 20 protons. Okay, now let's draw our 20 neutrons. All right, let's move on to our electrons now. We have 20 electrons that we need to fit into this diagram. So let's start with our first shell. And if you remember, that first shell can hold two electrons. Now this shell is full. So we have to move on to a second shell now and start filling that up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This second shell is now full because that can only hold eight electrons. So then we have to start filling up a third shell. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And now this third shell is full. So we have two in our first shell, eight in the second shell, and eight in our third shell. And this third shell can only hold eight. So this is also full. And we have two to go. This is 18 electrons and we have two electrons left. So now we start up a fourth shell and we put our remaining two electrons in that fourth shell. And this is our electron configuration for calcium. I hope that this lesson has helped you build confidence in collecting information about the elements and then using that information to draw representations of those elements. Later on in chemistry, you do learn that some shells can hold more electrons, but for now in high school, we generally teach up to the first 20 elements, so up to and including calcium. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.